So this passage that I'm preaching on this morning comes right after Christ's baptism, which I preached on the last time I was perched up here. Uh, So if you will recall, Jesus at his baptism has a spiritual experience in which he hears a voice that says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And I asked you at that time to hear that voice speaking to you and reminding you that you are a beloved child of God in whom God is well pleased. And I asked you to feel that in every cell of your body and spirit. And so this is where Jesus was. I feel like I'm turning my back to you. This is where this is where Jesus was when we start the scripture today. And it says that the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, so he's filled with that sense of being a beloved child of God. He's moving towards his call to his ministry. And the Spirit drives him into the wilderness where he is tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. He's just heard heard one voice that said, you are my beloved child. And the next moment, he nears another voice that says, so if you're this son of God, then prove it. And I bet that after I preached that sermon a month ago, maybe you had a moment in which you felt that you truly were a beloved child of God, but I bet there was a voice that came in right after that, wasn't there, that said, oh yeah? So this is going to happen in our lives. You know, we're called to something. Each of us are on the edge of our ministry. Each of us are called to do something in particular. And I don't know what your particular call is, but I know for certain that it is based in being a conduit for God's love. All the time, every day, 24-7, in every interaction, you are called to be a conduit for God's love and share that love to everyone, to be as clear a presence of the divine in other people's lives as you can. But then we get this other voice. So what do we do when that other voice comes up? Well, we follow Jesus. That is what we always do. There's always some path that he's walked that we can emulate. And so in this case, we have this allegory of, the temptation. And uh, I came up with a handy dandy acronym. It's ART. A, which is awareness. We need to be aware of where we might get tripped up. R, rootedness. We need to be rooted in a spiritual practice. And T is trust. We need to trust in our identity as a beloved child of God. So let's go through it. A, we have the temptation, three temptations in this text. Now, I don't think these are just random temptations. I think these are actually things that Jesus the man had to get through before he could truly live into his ministry. He's... 30 by the time this is written, so he's had a little life, and he's been tripped up once or twice, I bet. And let me think. Yeah, most of you are over 30 out here. (laughs) And so I'm thinking you've had enough life 
that you know where your fault lines are. I think probably you know exactly where you can be tripped up. In Jesus' case, as it says in the scripture, we have the first one, which I'm going to say is selfishness. Turn this rock into bread. I'm going to call that selfishness, self-serving. He's at a vulnerable place, and he's being told, turn this into bread for yourself. No consideration of other people. Nothing is talked about that in the scripture. So I'm going to call that one selfishness. The next one is power and prestige. He's at the high point of the temple. He looks out and says, all the kingdoms of the world can be yours. This desire for power and prestige, I think it plays out a lot in my life. I'm wondering if maybe in yours as well. And interestingly, Jesus really knew that in order to live into his ministry, he was going to have to get past that one. Because that's exactly what the disciples wanted him to do, right? We find out later on that the disciples are all about earthly power and prestige, changing life on earth so that there might be freedom for the Jews in a political sense. So he knew he had to make his way through that one. And then this last one, throw yourself down, and the angels will catch you. I'm going to call that spiritual superiority. That's a good one for the ego. It likes, it likes that. Spiritual superiority. I'm so much more spiritual than you. I ride my bicycle and don't drive my car. So these are the three things that Jesus had to work through before he could be fully present the world around him so he could live into his ministry. Now, how does he respond when he sees those fault lines in himself and knows that he has a challenge ahead of him? Well, we go to R, rootedness. He is deeply rooted in a spiritual practice. As Denny said, it's Lent. Lent is a great time to become deeply rooted in your spiritual practice, whatever it may be. For you, it could be meditation, it could be yoga, it could be reading the scriptures. For Jesus, we see he is deeply rooted in his religious heritage. He quotes Deuteronomy in the Torah, the wisdom literature of the Psalms, We know he was a man of prayer and meditation so that when that voice came into his head, he had an immediate response. He had something upon which he was rooted. I don't know what it is for you, but you got to find it because you need to do it every day. Every day we come upon our own fault lines. Every day we get tripped up. And every day you need a place to be rooted so you can live into your call of shining God's love and light to everyone. Now, we at South Church are very lucky because we have one built right into our worship together every Sunday. We have our benediction. That's printed at the back of the bulletin every Sunday, and we say together every week. And there have been a number of you that have come to me and said, you know, Sandra, you know what just happened? I was talking to a friend, and this friend started being really nasty. And I was going to jump right in there and say something terrible back, and then I heard this voice. And it said, render to no one evil for evil. And I kept my mouth shut. Or I was at Geisler's, and I was absolutely rushed, 
and I'm freaked out because I can't make my budget for my groceries this week. And I saw the bin for the food pantry, and I thought, not this week, can't do it this week. And then I heard that voice that said, help the afflicted. And so I took one can of soup, just one, but it was a can of soup, and I put it in the bin. So you can be rooted, you can be rooted right in our practice here that we do together, so that voice comes to you when you have choice. And then we have T, A-R-T, which is truth. You need to believe what God has told you and what I keep trying to remind you of, that you are a beloved child of God in whom God is well pleased. You need to know that. And I know that that truth is hard to hear. But in order to live into your call, you need to have faith in that. You need to know that. Another man who needed to know that in order to live into his call was Martin Luther King, Jr., Now, there is a story that he told. Well, 1956, I think it was, so not real far into his ministry, he was a young man with a young family. He and Coretta lived in a home, and their first child was an infant, and Martin was at work, at the church. And Coretta was home when she heard a noise on the front porch. And so she ran to the back room where her baby was, and seconds later, a bomb went off. Someone had thrown a handmade bomb onto the front porch of their home. All the windows shattered, the glass blew in, the porch was destroyed. Martin runs home, hugs his family. His wife and his child are fine. And then he goes outside where a very angry mob has gathered. Men with pitchforks and hoes and shovels and whatever they could find for weapons. And the white police force is there. And Martin comes out and says, my friends, peace be with you. Those that live with the sword will die by the sword. Go home. My family and I are fine. Go home. And he dispersed the crowd. And then he walked into the wilderness, the wilderness that he found at his own kitchen table as the sun set and his wife and daughter fell asleep, he sat there at his kitchen table with that light glaring down from overhead. And he entered into his own wilderness and he found his fault lines. He became aware. Because he realized He could not do the work he was called to do unless he was able to forgive everyone of everything all the time. So he had to make a choice between hate and forgiveness. And he realized he could not do his ministry if he was afraid of death. He had to get over his fear of dying. He had to know that he came from the source of love, and that's where he would return. It was those two places for Martin Luther King 
that he needed to become aware of, and he needed to work through it. And we know enough about him that we know he was rooted in his own spiritual practice, in his own religious background. He prayed and he read scripture. And so he's sitting there at the table praying. And around 3 a.m., he hears a voice. And the voice said, Martin, do not be afraid. Trust me. And he said, from that moment on, he was never afraid again. And so, my friends, in this season of Lent, I would like you to not be afraid. I would like you to live into your call of being that guiding light of God's love. I want you to become aware of your fault lines. It's okay, we've all got them. I want you to become rooted in a spiritual practice. Find the one that works for you. And I want you to find the truth in your own identity as a beloved child of God. Amen.